Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very excited to have my esteemed guest, Mr. Roman Oban, in studio with me today. Roman, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm very excited to have you on the podcast today. Roman, can you introduce yourself to the listeners? My name is Roman Oban. I am currently, uh, I work for the NFL, National Football League, as, as a current vice president of football development, which includes a ton of things uh, that would be too long to explain, but <laughs> helping grow, advance, advance, develop the game, engage stakeholders, help lead all NFL clubs uh, about their strategies, work with partners, all types of stuff. So I work for the NFL league office. Um, and I played 12 years in the NFL um, as an offensive tackle, won a Super Bowl with uh, Super Bowl 37. That's Roman numeral XXXVII <laughs> back then. And, uh, you know, John Gruden obviously was the head coach of that team. And uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely been through a lot of different life turns and, and challenges and how do you address those and, and all that stuff. And I'm definitely looking forward to having this discussion today. Oh, I appreciate that. I would love to know, I know you grew up outside of the States and I would love to know kind of like what your journey was like from living, you know, overseas and abroad into growing up in the U S and then your journey learning football, how it kind of opened doors for you through high school and college. And then obviously your time in the league. So just give me kind of like a high level overview of like what things look like. Um, you know, with that journey. Yeah, so um, just high level, I was born in, in Cameroon, West uh, West Africa. It's actually the most, the, the east, the, the last like Eastern country um, in West Africa before it's considered Central Africa. Like Cameroon actually uses Central African currency. So when you think of like the tr- traditional West African countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, Togo, Ivory Coast, Senegal, you know, those countries, and then Cameroon is like right before you get the Chad, um, Central African Republic, and so um, so Cameroon's kind of sandwiched, kind of in the middle there, uh, but it's considered West Africa, so like West Central. Uh, my mom was a young, you know, single mom, and and was uh, she was bilingual, and and she applied to to be to come move to the states and work as a really a bilingual secretary, uh, working for the Cameroon Embassy at the time. Um, she left me behind so I could stay, so she can you know come back and get established. And it's probably I don't know three years or so. I came back around age four. Uh, flew over with my uncle, grew up in D.C., so grew up single mom, and um, my mom, I watched my mom actually take, like, 18 credits a semester and work 40 hours a week, like, taking me to class, um, sitting in the back of the room, like, after daycare, like, like it was, it was, like, I was, like, in a classroom, like, up until fifth grade, like, night school, as I say, I would tell you I went to night school when, when I was in elementary school, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, my my you know my mom ended up being a uh, working for World Bank IMF as information officer, oh, wow. and, and so so I grew up in D.C. like right downtown near the White House and all the stuff, and and D.C. was crazy back then in the '80s. But I appreciate the education I had. Didn't play football till high school. Went to a, a prep school, uh, Gonzaga High School. So mm-hmm. you know the poor kid on scholarship uh, going to the prep school around with all the white kids and, and kind of adjusting to that. Yeah. Where the life life outside the school is like your neighborhood and your block, and then life inside the school is like going to school with Dan Quayle's kids <laughs> when he was vice president. You know, so yeah, a little different. Yeah, that that whole dichotomy I think uh, definitely gives you a different perspective, and you don't really appreciate it until you get older. So um, and yeah, I didn't play football till tenth grade officially. Ended up going to prep school uh, at Fort Union Military. Went to Louisville and, and played 12 years in the NFL. Um, it's kind of crazy, I guess, you know, you mentioned when you look back and, and the opportunities that you're afforded as a child that, like, you don't necessarily understand when you're in it. Um, it it's kind of crazy when you mention like, going to school with, like, a, you know, vice president's ch- child and, yeah. and whatnot. But I'm kind of curious, like, how being that outsider kind of, like, impacted, like, your work ethic and kind of, like, what drove you to maybe be successful in life because – it goes without saying that like you are at a different level than your peers, right? You're coming in on scholarship. Your parents aren't someone who's like famous and or a celebrity and or a politician. So what kind of experiences did you have while you were in that school that kind of maybe gave you fuel or fire that kind of lit you for their, you know? Yeah. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, a great student back then. So, you know, your, 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 your DC public school system, um, at that point, like, wasn't a great system. So I, I bounced around. Went to, I was the kid that went to, like, six elementary schools before you got to high school because we kept moving. And mm-hmm. and so all those all those uh, character lessons and grit lessons I was learning back then, like, every kid kind of had to learn that. I mean, there was no template for grit. You just It just was. And and even kids whose, whose parents had the means, they made them 
do paper routes and work at grocery stores and bag groceries. Like everyone did something. Like oh, no one, nice. no one is can just go through life at that point and just Huntington Learning Center, Kumon, <laughs> organized activity. I mean that that world didn't exist back then. So yeah. um, it was a life I knew. Um, taking a bus or a train when you're eight years old, like by yourself to like go across town, like that wasn't. And I think honestly, um, so I was born in 1972. So right around age eight or nine is when the, if you remember the, the Atlanta child murderers, um, it's like historically, you'd have to look it up. In and, DC. Yeah, no, it was in Atlanta, but it okay. was early eighties. Mm -hmm. um, when kids started ending up on, on cereal boxes and oh, milk cartons, that yes. whole, that mm -hmm. whole narrative, yeah. that's when. Early eighties. Yeah, and this is my perspective, I think that's when the video game company started making more money because he, he started being afraid of the neighbor versus it's like the village runs a child, go across the street, you know, this person, that person. Yeah. And then it's like, wait a minute, that neighbor might be a creep. Like, let's not stay inside, play video games, be entertained. And so like throughout the eighties and stuff and, and where it is now, like the indoor entertainment is like more valuable than being, than the outside unknown. And I think, that's I very think interesting. I grew up in an era where, you had to go outside and, and figure it out and you see a dead mouse and it stinks or <laughs> you, you step in dog crap when you're playing. You're like, oh man, now it's on the bottom of your shoes and you're taking a <laughs> stick and getting the crevices. I mean, the yeah. things that every urban kid goes through. Um, um, I appreciated it, honestly. And, and I think it's unfortunate that every kid doesn't um, come out okay. Just like every suburban kid doesn't go to an Ivy League school and become like a CEO. And that, that's sure. not, so yeah. both in both cases, you got to draw from life experiences. You got to develop some sort of mental toughness. You got to have some sort of support structure at home, even if it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, love at home is love at home, um, and that's and I truly believe that. So I had love and structure at home, which defended me and and from just making dumb decisions. I knew a bunch of guys that made dumb decisions, mm -hmm. um, and and we've all made dumb decisions. They just don't land you in jail or land you in some Worst crazy situation, situation yeah. with the authorities or whatever. So. Um, and I think sports keeps you out of that. I think mean, doing stuff keeps you busy, so you could focus on other things than focusing on like what whatever. What kind of trouble you can get yourself yeah, into? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I think the greatest advantage that I've ever had in my life is my family. Right, you're born into something where you don't get to choose, right, who your parents are, who your siblings are, like what your upbringing looks like. But if you're born into a family that's built on love, like that's mm -hmm. it's a cheat code for life. I've yeah. said it often. If I didn't have the parents that I have, if I didn't have the brother and sister that I have, yeah. I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. Yeah, I, I try to, I mean, I raised, raised two boys, um, and just, I'll get this out now. I mean, the two boys that from age eight till high school were always seeing like some black dude get killed on their phone, on videos. I mean, that's their, that's their life. So we could say we had it tougher, but we really didn't have it that much tougher because mm -hmm. everything was in front of you. Yeah. Uh, the cyberbullying, I didn't buy into that until you, you saw instances of that, how that affects people. Um, you know, getting your ass kicked or jumped at the gas station and just taking the L that we used to say versus the whole world sees it and it's being videoed and now everyone's <laughs> reminding that you're the guy that got his ass kicked or yeah. whatever. I mean, that's a, that's traumatic. And so, um, I just, I try to just paint a picture that I didn't have, um, being a dad, what kind of dad would I be? How supportive would I be? But I'm also smart enough to know that you, you have to manufacture the grit and the toughness. So, I mean, we're in Montclair, New Jersey and, and my older son worked at the the pizza place on the corner of Grove and uh, and uh, Walnut. Nice folding boxes, like doing all types of stuff. Both of my kids worked there, um, um, and you know my older son RJ, he sold Christmas trees at a Christmas tree lot, like during the Christmas holidays. So it's forty degrees outside, and you're tying up trees, and you're you're coming home with like crinkled up five dollar bills and singles, and and so, um, and and it's funny. It's like, look, you're the suburban black kid, and people are treating you like you're the kid. It's the like you're the kid the how who I was when I was growing up, and I think that, and that's okay too because you get to be around, you get to see how people treat people who don't know who they are or any of that crap, which I don't, I never believe in that. So it sounds like you've been able to instill a pretty strong work ethic in your children because you had one growing up, and I'm wondering what was like the better provider of that work ethic for you? Was it sports? Was it family? Like what was like the like the initial installation of that work ethic that you've now been able to carry over to your children? Well, I think the sports gives you the structure, and mm -hmm. I think, and 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 for boys, the the guy who's a varsity football player is like the def, def, definition of macho or whatever that is, right in high school. Um, but you need to have the support and the structure at home too to make to make sure that you're grounded. Win, lose, or draw, you're not defined by whatever whoever whatever you are, whatever you did. Sure. Um, and the kid who does well in the spelling bee and that's his thing or her thing. 
I think is just as confident as the kid who's a really good athlete. And I think sometimes, I think we understand that more now, but it was like back then it was like the jock was more important, the quarterback was more important 100%. than the kid on the chess club. 100%. Um, and it's great to see the kids that do other stuff feel just as valued and just as important as any kid who does anything else. Well, it's nice because we live in an age where intellect is no longer like a nerd thing. It's yeah. like a cool thing. Like everyone's like, a nerd. Yeah, like, right. Like nerd, oh, being yeah. a nerd is cool. It's funny because like I haven't gotten that way till I've gotten older, like where I've gotten nerdy about learning new things, about learning about learning. Like I just read a book about ways to learn better, how to like, like facilitate and like cognitively drain and like suck in knowledge better yeah. um obviously you were a successful high school football player you went to college you played in the nfl um that instills a pretty strong work ethic and like a character building that not a lot of people can relate to i mean there's what like a thousand nfl players a year like i'm 1800 1800 so Total, there's two thousand yeah. nfl players a year you're a very small fraternity what kind of like what does your life look like while you're in the league you're there for 12 years you're probably making good money. You're traveling across the world. You're working your ass off. And then, like, what's it like when that stops? And you're like, wow, I'm a very young man <laughs> in all respects yeah. to, like, normal human beings. What do I do now? Yeah. I think while you're playing, um, I mean, no no guy at 22 is, is, is a mature adult, right? I mean, <laughs> the average guy at that age is hopefully just getting ready to graduate from college, maybe bartending on – trying to figure it out and hopefully doesn't have to move back home, yeah. you know, and all that. And I think for me, then you, you sign a million dollar deal at 22 and, and it, it's, it's, it's like, there's always two or three, there were always two or three different battles going on all the time. There's like the battle that me, me trying to take a job, keep my job as a starter, get to free agency and all that stuff. And then there's like me managing myself through all that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people wanting things from you all the time. Sure. Um, no one relishes being the prom queen and, mm -hmm. and you don't realize um, you don't realize the value of what you're going through because you're in it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, but as I got older, then I got married, then I had my first son, then I had my second son. And then, and at the end of it, it was like me being the mentor to the younger kids was, was pretty cool. Um, and I did a lot. I was a player up, uh, when I played in, um, um, NFL PA players association. I, got, I did, I did a lot of involvement. I was one of the first guys to, um, in a 10 year span to like get a master's degree, like while he was playing. So wow. I went to, I was a fifth year senior at Louisville. So uh, there was a program, really, it was really for guys who left early. And so, and NFL would like fund it. And so like, I was there, I already had th like six or nine credits in grad school when I left the college. Mm -hmm. And so fairly Dickinson was like the school that, that the giants used. Um, the jets were in Long Island at the time. So they used Hofstra. So every NFL team actually has a school that they used. Wow. This is life before online learning. Yeah, um, right, yeah. And so I went to Fairley Dickinson, like it took me four years. I got my master's in public administration. It was just a way to just keep me focused, you know. That's cool. Um, you know, work out in the morning, go to class at night and that whole thing. Try, I try to just keep a normal schedule because my buddies are like, it's like my buddies would live vicariously through me, but like I'm living vicariously through like, what would my life be like if I wasn't in the NFL? Sure. Um, I think, but when, when football was over, um, it's 2008. It's like whatever that day was in September, the recession happens, and then your numbers are, your numbers look different. And you're like, what the hell's going on with this banking shit? What is, what is oh, all yeah. this crap going on? You know, and so you just had to readjust. And then, but then I'm looking at like I got a second grader and a you know kindergartner or whatever, and I was like, they, and I, and I said, at that point I said like I want them to look up to me, like ten years from now, like it's 2008, right? When it's 2018, and they're now. 18 and 15 years old like I want them to look up to me then too and I, and I don't want to be just a guy that used to play in the league hmm. because it's easy to I was old enough to like see some of my heroes um you know growing up uh, at, at the time they were called the Redskins obviously I'll preface that but yeah. seeing some of my heroes as I got older I'm like man I remember this guy in the 80s and then you see these guys and they're like they're not they're not all doing well um they're not all doing well emotionally some of them regret playing the game i mean the concussion thing was going on at that point where mm -hmm. guys are saying i wish i never even played because i'm all screwed up and 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 so i just i try to do something about it by making sure that 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 i was an example of you can be successful on the field and off the field um and something else just use the same approach and preparation as you did when you were getting ready to block whoever for the cowboys mm -hmm. um as you would going to a sales meeting or going to some 
presentation. Like I, I, I get competitive when it's time to prepare for something. And that's, I think that's something that football did for me for sure that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone through that. I think that's interesting because, you know, being that there are two football players having this conversation right now, one of us achieved a slightly higher level of adulation than the other. Obviously, I didn't play in the NFL. <laughs> But, you know, I was a two-time New Jersey State champion football player. And I think a lot of the lessons, like you mentioned, that I learned in doing two-a-days in that camaraderie with teammates is a drive to be successful. And I have I know there was like a whole big thing, like you said, 2008 to 2011, where everyone was like, don't let your kids play football. And I look at it as like one of the best things that ever happened to me. Super lucky to have done it. Um, but I never had to like reconcile a career in the sport with what am I going to do next? It disappeared the day I graduated high school, right? Yeah. So I didn't have to ever have to worry about that. But I did take a lot of those lessons into my career, like you said in sales, in a plethora of corporate America jobs. What was the first thing that you did when you retired? Like, what was your first regular, you know, Roman Esquire, you know, normal job? It's funny. Um, the first thing I did is, like, I, I must have had, like, 500 business cards that I collected over the years. Mm -hmm. I, I had about 10 Ziploc freezer bags full of, like, business cards and I, I, it must have took me a whole Sunday, and I just bought, you know, I went to, um, I, I won't say these stores because I, they're not sponsoring the show, and I, I respect that. So I went to <laughs> Home the, Depot, the generic office, where, office whatever, Depot, right, whatever yeah. that is, and I bought these, like, business card albums, and I just said, okay, this guy could help me. This person can't. I think, okay, this person. So I just put two lists. One, hey, I'm done playing. I'm living back in northern New Jersey. I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, got a master's degree. I've done a bunch of internships, Capitol Hill, Pepsi Bottling Group, all this stuff. Cool. Um, and just, hey, let them know what I'm doing. And then the other one was like, you know, we had dinner two weeks ago, uh, three years ago. We sat at a banquet, and you have ever need anything. Well, now, you know, let, let's have lunch. Let's just see what the world is like now. Um, and I think I was a guy that did a lot of different stuff, and, and I, I always prided myself on having versatility. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, it's a book range that talks about that. But like back then, like it was all about being the specialist and the scientist and the art or the lawyer or the doctor or the, mm -hmm. and if you weren't that, then like you, that's what you've spent your whole life trying to do. Um, and the value of being versatile wasn't as important back then. And so, uh, you know, you, you, you feel, and it's not like you miss football because my body didn't miss training camp. Sure. I mean, playing 12 years in the NFL means you spent a year of your life in training camp, Oof. like wow. a month. Oh, you know, that, I mean, that's that. So physically, and I'm not. My brain is fine. I don't have any issues there. How are I, your legs? <laughs> I mean, I had nine knee scopes and, wow. and two reconstructive foot surgeries, and you know, I broke my hand a couple times, and I've got one I little got one of those little mild crooked <laughs> pinky over here, like most a lot of guys. But um, so they're just wearing. I'll, I'll never run a New York marathon. I mean, sure, so I, I can deal with that. So that's yeah. fine. But um, I think the, the 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 most important thing I took away is like. Like, I kind of had made a little self, like, manifesto about who I was going to be and my life wasn't going to be about my career. And and, and it's and I, I just had to willingly accept that I was just going to get my ass kicked while the country was getting their ass kicked, too. Mm -hmm. Which, it would, everyone was in the business of getting their ass kicked in 2008. So, it, it, it wasn't so bad. Um, so, the first couple of jobs, to answer your question... One of my buddies, we had a startup. It was called the Corporate Playbook. It was trying to get take athletes, um, college athletes, and and sharpen their resumes. It almost like build this data of like resumes and and say, and then go sell it to uh, was like SAS seat licenses for HR software. Say instead of pulling this LinkedIn crap, like why don't you sell? Look at candidates that were Division three softball, like all Americans. I mean, there's a there's value there in being a student athlete that mm -hmm. you can. That it works in the sales first. That works in the marketing sure. team, and so we, we it, it was it was it was therapeutic for me because I'm going to Yale, like speaking to student athletes, like Seton Hall soccer team. I mean, I'm doing all this life and off the field and character stuff. And meanwhile, I was still going through my own transition mm -hmm. at the same time as a, as a former pro athlete. Like I'm 35, and you feel like your life is over. But it's like yeah. then you talk to a bunch of 60 year olds that went through the 80s and went through the 70s and went through the they're like your life's just beginning actually. So. I was able to just gain perspective from other people. So I did that. Um, I, I work for a company, NCSA still exists, uh, National Collegiate uh, Scouting Association, um, where I talk about recruiting, like high school recruiting and stuff. Um, and I worked for, it's now called Outfront Media, but CBS Outdoor. Oh, yeah. Like billboards, mm -hmm. digital, like I sold advertising. So I did a lot of stuff because, I, one, I can't say still. And secondly, I just 
I wanted to take a swing at the real world and just say, this is who I, who am I going to be in five, 10 years from now? So that's cool. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that, you know, like you say, you're 35 and you're, you know, confronting a big change in life change. What does that do for like your confidence, right? Like you were a person who is very accustomed to spending one day a week for 20 weeks a year in front of thousands of people cheering your name. And then that goes to you now being, you know, Roman Oban singular person, no longer having the adulation of fans and people like hyping you up. So what does that do for like, from like a confidence perspective? Cause I'm super curious how you kind of rectify the person who you were for those 12 years with who now you need to become, which is like, Roman Oban, the father, the provider, et cetera, in a completely new kind of landscape. Yeah. You know, the toughest part was just dealing with everybody else who thought I was like all messed up because I wasn't playing football anymore. Oh, shit. And so that's the, that was the issue. Like, like nothing was worse than growing up like in a tough environment and trying to balance life and, and working in the summer's construction. Like, I mean, I worked one year to like pay my tuition, my mm-hmm. high school tuition, which is like, I mean, the school costs like ten grand, but I was my mom only paid like two thousand dollars. Like I worked the summer to just pay the tuition, mm-hmm. and like making five hundred bucks a week or whatever it was, and like just taking the check and paying the tuition, like going to the Birch's office. I mean, I like nothing was harder than that. Mm-hmm. So at thirty five and like living in this big house and like trying to figure out what my, I, I, I did not expect anyone to feel sorry for me. So sure. the first lesson was like. It's you're going to get your ass kicked and it's okay, but it's not the end of it. Like, what are you going to learn about yourself? Like, where do I want to be in six months, a year? When I look back on the year, like, what improvements did I make? So I, I focused on the improvements mm-hmm. and what I was learning, who I was meeting with, and, and focused less on the life sucks because football's over. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I, like, I look at, like, kind of the chapters of my life, and I'm in a very similar position where at 35 years old, I've eschewed like corporate America and working for other people besides myself because I spent such a long time of my life chasing a dollar, chasing a career, chasing things that didn't add up to like happiness internally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's almost the inverse because you had like that initial post-college life where you're doing the fucking coolest possible job, right? Like everyone wants to be a pro athlete. Everyone wants to be in front of like millions of fans, et cetera. And it's very funny how like we were kind of similarly in the same boat at the same time period. And I think from a confidence perspective, like I've chosen a creative career where, you know, the thing that I create is my photograph, my podcast, like I'm doing these things for myself, but I'm also hoping to impact other people. And I think for you, it's like you're doing something initially that was for a lot of other people, also yourself and your family. And then it switches to like a very kind of uh, selfish, internalized kind of area. And I think that's like very funny kind of sort of uh, symbiotic yeah i mean it's um it is it is interesting and 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 one of the uh, and i i I talked to a few guys that were like a lot older than me Mm -hmm. uh like george martin like some of the old older giants when i came back and they said look we went through the same thing 10 years ago you know 89 you know football's you know around that time early 90s now you're trying to figure it out um and say just take all the time you need but just do something you know start off doing something like Go and I don't say this the wrong way, but like go take a job making seventy grand and like sure. learn about yourself, you know. And 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 everyone's life isn't Peyton Manning with a hundred million dollars in the bank. I mean, the majority of guys um, bounce around. You know, veteran minimum is like two three hundred thousand back then. But then like you got to pay your Tahoe, you got a condo, you got a place in Florida. I mean, you gotta you gotta deal with life. Mm-hmm. And so when life is over, you got to reconcile everything financially and make sure you're okay and, and whatever that those goals are. Like, pay your house off because you're not going to be able to, like, keep whatever. You have to just adjust. You have to adjust, yeah. you know, financially. And so um, I think through all those life adjustments, like, I also realized that you're always transitioning. Mm-hmm. Your life at 15, 25, 35, 40 is different. Yeah. Child's involved. Child are getting older. What do they need? You're not always thinking about yourself. Like, you're always resp- – I mean, my wife was in law school my last year in the league. Mm-hmm. And so I um, – when I got done, she's finishing law school. So I had to be more of a servant at home while she's trying to accomplish the woman she wants because she finished undergrad later because we were married and she started law school later because of me so like I had to be a a good husband and return the favor and just be supportive of like what she wanted to do as well so that's part of it I'm super glad you mentioned the kind of like timeline of life because I've also I've often said on my podcast how like you are always like segmented with like okay I need to go to high school and graduate and get a good you know college 
offer and do well in college to get that good first job. And it's always like, where am I going to be in five years? And like, I got to get, you know, make more money so I can buy a better watch and get a nicer car. And, yeah. you know, a lot of these things are like commonalities across like every landscape, right? Every human being kind of deals with this like timeline where like in their head, five years from now, I'm going to be doing X, Y, Z. Right. When you are doing that as a professional athlete, are you cognitive of the fact that you've got kind of like a timer on with your career? All the time. Yeah. I think every year is a reevaluation year. So it's like rookie year. Okay, I made it through rookie year. All right, I'm going to try to start next year. Then I became a starter year two. Okay, now I got to get to free agency. I got to make sure I'm healthy. You get a little knee injury. You got a little surgery at the end of the season. Does that affect free agency? I mean, you, you like you go through those cycles. It's like the, the, the joke is like the four cycles of an actor. It's like, Who's Roman Oban? Give me Roman Oban. We want a young Roman Oban, and then who's Roman Oban again? It's like that. Yeah. Like, I went through that in 12 years, and it was, like, literally every quarter. Years one to four were different from five to eight, then, like, the, the different than, you know, obviously eight to 12. That's interesting. And I would imagine, like, your place in the locker room changes on that kind of quarterly basis, right? So, like, who you are and, and like, what you represent for the team alters on mm-hmm. a year-by-year basis, like – whether you're all pro Roman Oban, I don't know if you're ever an all pro or whatever it might be like that level that you're contributing to the team changes. Was there, I'm actually curious like what point in your career did you like walk into the locker room and maybe feel like you didn't belong anymore? Did that ever happen or was it like over before you had an opportunity to kind of feel that way? No, I was a starter. Uh, so it was my 10th year. I got injured uh, really bad foot injury. Like my foot tore off my ankle. Oh. So it's like the ACL of your foot and ankle, basically. It's okay. a complete tear. Um, uh, it's called a third-degree plantar uh, tear. Yikes. So if any any orthopedics out there. So I had a single distraction orthodesis, heel osteotomy, and a calcaneal fusion. So I've got a plate and like six screws in, in like the side of my foot. Wow. Um, and so when your body – your body's different at 32 than it is at 22, obviously, as, a, as an athlete. But then you get the injury recovery is different. So um, – Year 10, end of year 10, I'm still injured. I come back, like, year 11, I'm, I'm trying to come back. I'm, and then they draft this rookie, he ends up starting, then he becomes a pro bowler. And then I'm like, oh, and then El- that's Lene Thomas had the big season in 06. Mm-hmm. So I'm, like, recovering from my injury in 2006, and then, then it's the 07 season. I'm just trying to make the team. Wow. I'm like, all right, veteran minimum is 900000 I need to make the team this year because we're building this house in Kenilon. Like, I need to, like, I want to pay it off, like, right away. You know, like, yeah. like the goals are different. So, and so I was almost, like, over-indexing on, like, reaching out to the young guys and showing the organization that, like, I was okay with that role because mm-hmm. my body just wasn't responding this, the way that it was, you know, a couple of years before. Um, and I knew, I knew my 12th year that, like, all right, I think I'm, you know, I'm 34 now. I think I'm, 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 this is it. Like my body just isn't, doesn't feel the same. And I'm like always in the cold tub, always getting ice, always, you know, like, the like, worst. like <laughs> every day, like just, I'm stretching on my day off, just stretching. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, you're, it, so, and not that I didn't belong in the locker room, but, but a lot of funny, um, it becomes an argument about music at that point. So <laughs> 2007, like... Trap music. These, yeah, trap music starting up, Soldier Boy and all that. You remember that song? Like, yeah. So, so like, and I'm like, no, man, I'm like Biggie and Puffy and I'm like 97, <laughs> yeah. mid-90s Wu-Tang. You know, like it, it's a different... Yeah, yeah completely different yeah. generation of... And these guys like, oh, man, that old stuff. Yeah. I'm like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> well, that was the wrong time because like now it's probably all Biggie and like 90s rap that's playing because yeah. rap nowadays is just yeah, no, garbage. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, so you obviously had like a, I think the career average in the NFL is like three, three and a half years. Yeah, three and a half or so. Yeah. So you like quadrupled the amount of timeline in the NFL. What's like one thing that you look at, obviously besides your Super Bowl victory, that is like something that you look at as the thing you're most proud of? Um, I think the journey as a whole, I'm, I'm most private, but I think when I got to the Chargers, uh, they weren't very good, and like Drew Brees was was there and, and Flutie was, and we had four quarterbacks on the roster. And then it, it was like Drew Brees was there. Flutie was kind of like the starter, but not really. Um, and then they drafted Phil Rivers, who's a rookie. Wow. And so we, it was a lot of like competition. And then and, and Antonio Gates was like this unproven, like second year tight end. Sure. LaDane Thompson was the best young back in the league, like the next Emmett Smith. I mean, so I saw all this stuff develop back then as the old guy coming in. And yeah. so. But then I walk into this locker room like the guy who won a Super Bowl, and who's and, and there's a bunch of young guys who's never who've never done it. So, um, 
the year before I got there, we were like the Chargers were four and twelve, I think, in the O three season, and then like we were twelve and four the next year. We lost to the Jets in the playoffs, um, wow. unfortunately. But like to see them to walk away from that team, my last four years in league, like we never saw anything less than a ten and six season at the Chargers. I mean, it was like Michael Turner. Remember, Darren Sproles was on the yeah. team. Yeah, thighs. Malcolm <laughs> Floyd, Vince Jackson. You know, rest rest in yeah, peace. Uh, I mean, we were loaded. Sean Merriman, like all those guys were yeah. on that on those teams. So. Um, they were great teams. Uh, they were great teams. Um, lacked the discipline of, an, of a of a veteran champion, team, yeah. but the talent and of, of a young team. I mean, I thought they were going to be like the early '90s Cowboys, just run through the league for the next five years. I mean, I remember. Th- I think the very first year I did fantasy football, I drafted Ladanian Tomlinson, and he had like thirty or twenty. What was the he set the twenty six twenty six touchdowns, whatever that was. Yeah, yeah I uh, he was my my pick, and I was like, wow. This team's going to win a Super Bowl in the next couple of years, and then you, you. So you're most proud of the time that you spent there. It's it's uh, being able to be that like veteran anchor to a very young yeah. group of core of guys. Because the stuff that was given to me about mental preparation, focus, like I gave it to Nick Hardwick. I gave it to the young guys, like he was an Sean, all pro, right? Yeah. yeah, like Sean. I mean, all those guys, like like practice is over and you're like getting into a fight with this guy. And when it's over, I'm saying, Hey, you know, who are you playing this week? You know, let me watch some film on him. Let me help you get ready for him. Make sure you keep your hands high. If he has hands are high, you bull rush him. If his hands are low, you double swat, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to have those kind of discussions about just being a professional. When I'm a young guy, I'm like, F these guys, you know, I hate, I hate all the vets. They all suck. I yeah. want to be the best. But then when I get older, it's like, all right, let me just, let me just lend my wisdom and, and, and shorten that learning curve because we had a really young team. That is uh, an incredible analogy for life in general because in my 20s, I didn't give a shit what anybody older than me had to think. (laughs) I didn't care what someone was trying to teach me. I didn't care about, you know, I knew everything at 25. And then at 35, I'm like, holy shit, I spent 10 years not learning anything from anybody else. I have so much time to make up. But it's funny that you mentioned that because I think like now and part of the reason why I'm having these conversations is being able to cultivate knowledge from other people from no matter where they're coming from, right? Like you're a former NFL player. I've had conversations with photographers and artists and musicians and whatever it might be. And the commonality that we all experience is like we have a dramatically common shared life experience but it's a matter of like what have i learned over this time period that has allowed me to be successful and will continue to help me grow and it's funny that like there's so much about life like i often say like geez man i wish i could have known at 25 xyz and i just don't think you're capable of learning something like that at that age you can't i mean and no one has it all figured out and we've seen child stars go from whatever to like drug addict like life is over we've seen People that are just nobody's waiting tables. The next year they're winning an Oscar. Yeah, you know we. I mean, just in my generation alone, just when you talk about music and entertainment, to see the progression of like Will Smith, Ice Cube, those guys that became like moguls. Yeah, you know, Shaq and I are the same age. This guy's a billionaire. Wow. You know, and, and the same and age like, as Shaq. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I remember the watching LSU. And Dick Vitale, he's only 18, baby. He's only 18. <laughs> you know, like, who's this guy from LSU? And then, you know, he's just dunking on everybody. So, and to see that, to see the, just to see the progression that people have made. And I think it, it's it's okay to, like, go through that process and, and learn from, because I grew up in a neighborhood, and I think most, I'm sure your parents did, where the old guy's opinion mattered. Like, mm-hmm. the old wise person that everyone went to in the neighborhood. or And, and I don't care if you're Italian, African American, whatever you are. 100%. Like, the old people's opinion really mattered. I don't know that it matters now anymore. Yeah. I think the cycle a little bit has been broken. Like a 48-year-old guy now listens to the same music a 25-year-old guy does. He wears this he wears the slender jeans and like he's, <laughs> it's like the 45-year-old guy trying to be 25. When I was 25, a 45-year-old guy was like listening Ancient. to Temptations or something like listening to, you know, Stevie Wonder's greatest whatever that, you know, Stevie Wonder's a great artist, but yeah. like there was a big separation between a yeah. 25 and a, and a 45 year old guy now sure. social yeah, media all that lot, stuff right? yeah it, it's changed it changed a little bit so when you look back on your life like obviously you're so young in the grand scheme of things is yeah. there anything that you didn't accomplish in your time as an NFL player and or now as you're entering your like second career that you haven't accomplished yet that you would love to see yourself do you know in the next 10 years I think I just always pray that I just continue to increase my capacity to lead because I, I, I just I have a lot of good perspective and, and emotional intelligence that I know honestly that a lot of people don't have mm-hmm. and so you try to like all right how do I 
monetize it more? Mm -hmm. How do I make myself a leader in the building I work in? How do I, does it help me do something on the side that's going to pay off, you know, later on? And like, just says, not not financially, but just legacy or whatever. Like, how do I, how do I can be a better dad to my kids? So they still look up to me Mm -hmm. at age 20 and 17. And then also at age 30 and 27, Mm -hmm. like no one wants to get to a place where like, you, you know, we all get to a place where you realize like, you know, your family's not perfect and everyone's got their little thing in their family and, School never taught me anything, and life sucks. Like I don't ever want um, the people that are around me to, to to have some negative view about me about if if, if I had a significant impact in their life. Mm. Like I don't want ever want anyone to ever be effed up because Roman because of how I because yeah. my experience with them in a relationship an ex girl like anything nobody I, I want no negative impact on anybody that I, that I come across. And I think that's it's hard, and it's, I'm not trying to live up to something that's unrealistic. But yeah. I think we all have a responsibility to be genuine kind just not be an a-hole to people I mean, yeah no I, not I, screw people over i mean that's it's that's, so funny because i lived yeah. such a number of years where i didn't give a shit about anybody other than myself like yeah. i didn't care about the wreckage of my wake right like you got those no wake zones and at yeah. the beach i don't care i'd be doing 50 in a fucking jet ski it doesn't matter <laughs> right like but that's how i was living my life and then you hit a certain age it's somewhere in your late 20s early 30s where you're like wow everything i say and do has an impact on someone yeah. like you start hearing about like you're talking about bullying and like shit like this kid who i'm like best friends with now i used to bully relentlessly when we were in like sixth grade and he brought it up to me a couple years ago i was like man i I don't remember that like i feel terrible and it's like so much of your life you're lived like unaware of the impact that you have on others and when you start realizing the impact that you do have it's a nice way to kind of give back and start doing better things um you mentioned leadership i would love to know from your perspective like what makes a good leader like what is a good quality and or a good mindset for a person to be a good leader a good leader, um, I think that, I mean, I actually have a, my own little thing here that I, uh, my leadership, uh, let me see where is it, if I could find it here. Um, I think a good leader is a good listener, mm-hmm. um, is a good, is a galvanizer, someone that can kind of bring people together for mm-hmm. one common cause, get people that don't necessarily get along per se to get along and, and, and accomplish a goal, um, um, and, and there's different types of leadership too. Like there's not, you know, football naturally brings this, like stand on top of a chair and make a speech and get everybody riled up. And and I think in this this motivational Monday world we live in, like a lot a lot of, a lot of that's BS. I mean, yeah. but braggadocious. Yeah, a, a leader is also just about being consistent, mm-hmm. um, being consistent and just batting singles and doubles and just being successful over like a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like corporately or in the business world or whatever world you're in, um, I should have this memorized, but I think it's like, you've got to be genuine. Um, you've got to have climbed through the ranks. Um, you've got to be polished. Uh, you've got to, again, I talked about uh, be a great listener, but galvanizer of people. You got to be able to bring people together. Mm-hmm. And then you got to be able to not take credit for something you started that became bigger than you. Oh, yeah. Like that's you, you got to Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, guys, you know, and I, you know, and I love, I love my guys out there, but it's like the, the big penis contest all the time with, with, with guys. <laughs> That's life. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a parent at, at you know, at, at my kid's school, but I, I just, I just, I hate being around the dads, man. I hate, and people are going to listen to this and think that I'm talking about them specifically, but just. I, I, I well, it's just, people who have the wrong motivations in life. It's yeah. like, I need to have the better car, the nicer watch, the bigger yeah, shore house, like, like it, all those things yeah. that don't mean shit. It doesn't. Yeah. And, and it was, oh, where's your Super Bowl ring? Oh, you wear? If, I, if I want a Super Bowl, I wear that ring all the damn time. No, well, you didn't. And that's why you didn't. Because yeah. <laughs> you don't understand what it's really all about. Yeah. You know? and, or, or even defining yourself by where you went to school, where your kids go to school. or yeah. like all, that, all that is a bunch of BS, man. All of it is. Like, it, it, I think we were starting to reach a point in society where a lot of that stuff is disappearing and it's not as important. Like, sure, there's always going to be the Harvards, the elites, like these people who go to these like really high-level universities and stuff where like they think they're better than anybody no matter what. And like that, like that, It's like that old money mentality, right? But mm-hmm. there's still that like young, hungry, you know, didn't come from much uh, kind of semi you know area of the of the population that are going to always fight against that yeah. and there's like this this kind of distinct opposite situation where these people no longer can like realize the important things i thought the last 2 years has taught pretty much everyone in the world what's important it's health 
and the health of your friends and family. What else is there? Man, have you? I don't know how much you've traveled in the last year. Not much. Man, people are angry, dude. Yeah. I've just seen like, if I was on five flights over the last year, I've seen one fight and two almost fights. Yeah. And it's not just about the mask thing, but just don't touch my bags, don't move my thing over. Like just the genuine courtes- courtesiness or whatever the word is, mm-hmm. the courteous nature of people like is, is gone, gone out the window. I think we need to get that back. That is a pie in the sky kind of <laughs> thought process, Roman. I got to be honest. I, I think it's got. I've harped, you know, wax poetic often on the negativities of social media. I think for as much as it brings people together and gives you instant access to everyone in the world, it's also doing a lot of harm and segregating us into these really small echo chambers, really small bubbles that yeah. like can kind of harm. Um, you could fill your day with content that only you that benefits you and what you want to see your whole day yeah what you read what you watch what you see the videos like your own narrative you could paint your own narrative all day and that's all that matters that's scary you know it's funny because we've talked a lot about music on this podcast everyone's you know spotify year and their rap kind of comes out and like when you look at like what the algorithms of apple music and spotify do is they constantly just recommend music that you say you like so like people are no longer uncovering new and different genres in music because these applications are only recommending things that you like so it's like when you live in a world where you're only getting you know spoon fed things that you say you like it's like how are you ever going to learn how are you ever going to grow how are you ever going to be inspired by someone you never heard before when you're not being given access to it. It's just like such a very bizarre, wild... No, you're right. I mean, because of that, I'm, I'm a Google Play music guy. You know, I'm team Android. <laughs> nice. uh, one of my good friends, uh, his name is Ace, he always... He said, probably the term was more popular before 2020, but like he called me Android Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, Hey, don't send Roman that video. You got to send it through, through WhatsApp because he, his video will come out foggy. Yeah. You know, so. So, so my sister's fiance, who funny enough works for the New York Giants, is an Android guy. So our family group chat is forever ruined by Dan. <laughs> Dan, I love you. You're the greatest guy. But, you know, we're, we've been pressuring him for, you know, two, two and a half years now to get an iPhone just so we can send pictures. I can't then. do it, man. I was the last person on earth to still have a Blackberry in like 2015. Wow. And so. You were the literal I, last person. And then I went Blackberry Android for like a year. Wow. It was like this weird like Blackberry because yeah. I, I like the it, Google functionality. Yeah. And then I got like an HTC one. And then I got the um, that was a else. good phone. And then I've had Samsungs ever since. So that was it. Like I just yeah. progressed from there. So that's funny. Yeah, uh, I think in in line with like leadershipness and like talking about like what is a you know what makes a good leader. I'm curious, like what about other people, and not necessarily just in corporate America, but like you know Roman Oban, the 48 year old human being. Like what inspires you to wake up in the morning? What inspires you to be like a, a positive influence in society? And like what like hypes you up to you know get out of bed every day? Well, I, I, I try to work out as much as I can three, four days a week. You know, when you're when gravity starts hitting you in your late 40s, you're, you're, you don't recover the same. Yeah. That Thanksgiving dinner, you know, <laughs> stays on you for a week and a half. You know, so I, I try to just make sure I'm, I'm physically good because that, that's a good stress reliever. Mm-hmm. Um, I try to make sure I just try to get things accomplished. That, that just having a sense of accomplishment, like the five things you got to get done every day. Um, because... You know, I, I, I tell my, my, my sons this all the time. Like, before you even get off the can in the morning, you're going to be told what's the popular videos, what, what, what's the shoes that are out that you need to buy. Like, like life is going to be dictated for you on your phone. And, that's, and I don't have some view on, on like, people knowing your where. I, I don't care about that. But just whatever you need to do to protect your own energy, whether it's reading something, working out, meditating, like just thoughtful, like mindful, whatever that is, I think you need to do that. Um, I try to just be more present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the way my life is now between work and the things that, I mean, I work in a challenging industry and it's very fast paced. And and you're always asked to, like something's always running something by you because you always have to make a decision that impacts a lot of people. So I try to just protect my energy as much as I can so that I can be at my best when it's time to be at my best. Ooh, that's I good. don't want to run out of gas at the time where I need to go full throttle yeah. because I'm always doing solving everybody else's problems. Yeah, I like know? that. Um, How do you protect your energy? You don't. You, you give people the access that you, you think they should have. Oh, I like you that. You don't. Somebody called me at 8 in the morning and I don't respond to them until 2 in the afternoon. All right. You, then that sets the, temp, the precedent that like, 
he's going to get back to you when he can. Yeah. Like, he's not going to text you back five minutes later. Like, I'm just not going to do that. Now, my wife, I will. I try oh, to, my, yeah. my son, my yeah. mom, I don't call my mom enough. No boy does. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but outside of that small red circle, um, you know, the way the world is like, you got the red, then the orange, the yellow, then the white circle. Everyone in the white circle thinks they're in the red. Yeah. And they think, okay, I need this, I need this. Like, no, no, no. I just, this, this is where we're at here. And, and so... I'm not afraid to say no to people about things. I'm not afraid to just say how I feel about something, even if it's, and, and I'm known for being pretty direct because I've got to sleep at night too. Yeah. Because when you become this big pot of, my mom used to say, because you can't be the big pot of rice. Mm-hmm. Everyone's always poking at it and then you're running out and then how do you refill yourself? Yeah. Because you're always pouring out to everyone's little cup that like wants, needs a little spout of, mm-hmm. of, of rice, whatever that is. So, um, it's, and it's not a perfect system at all. Uh, the last year and a half and two years has been tough and unprecedented. It has affected everyone differently in different ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, I stopped watching the news years ago. Oh, yeah. And then I got back on the news cycle train and it just made me depressed. Oh, for sure. I was like... I don't consume it anymore. Yeah. It's no yeah. way to live. I, made, I'm, I love my mom to death. She's the greatest human being I know on earth and I would be nowhere without her. But we would watch the news every night at dinner in high school and growing up and i'd be like why are we watching this it's six get the weather and sports the last 10 minutes yeah right it's six it's six stories about death and despair that one story about a dog who got lost in long island but found their owners in california yeah a fire happened someone turned 100 like yeah that's like every day that's it it's like what i want to watch this for and especially in the last two years with election drama covid drama it's like who's got time for that um but you mentioned mindfulness and meditation and you're in your 40s i'm curious like when in your life that came to you because it's recently come to me in my mid-30s and i've found a marked improvement in my life since I've started spending literally just 10 minutes a day doing nothing. And I can call it meditation. I can call it prayer. You can call it whatever you want, but I start my day with 10 minutes and I, well, so 20 minutes and I end my day with 10 minutes of nothing phone off TV off everything off and just fucking sit and stew in John. And wow, that's so pretentious, but you know what I'm saying? Just no, like that's real stuff. Though. Give like an yeah. opportunity to reflect. And I started writing a lot more. So I'm curious like when this kind of came to you in, in your life. It, it, it happened to me when um, probably like five years after football was over. So now it's like 2013. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing 20 things at once, you know, Giants radio and TV and, and trying to do business stuff on the side and, and trying to. F- and now I'm like been out of the league for five years and like I need to start to win now. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't need to take every lunch and every dinner and go to every event that someone thinks I need to go to because I'm a former giant. I'm like, that's when I, it was right around 13, 14 is when I started. I mean, even like going to counseling and stuff like that. Like I just, you know, I'm from the suck it up and, and just take it on the chin era, you know, mm-hmm. and I think people in my generation got their ass kicked for that. Yeah. Um, so, um, but it, it's, it's, it's okay to they say that things aren't okay, but like you have totally. to protect, you have to protect your, your energy. You have to. So, and I don't meditate all the time. Yeah. But sometimes when I think there's anxiety or something, I just like get on the Peloton, like work out, like do something just so I just need a minute, go up in the attic, like get on the computer, watch some old YouTube videos from the 90s <laughs> or something, you know, rap video, you know, yeah. you know whatever that is. You, so. you strike me as a very well adjusted, you know, middle aged man. And I'm curious how you would like see yourself in relation to your peers. Because I lived a whole world of experiences uh, through pro sports in my 20s and into, into my mid-30s, um, you know, traveling. And, more and, life experience. And being, yeah, yeah, having more access to stuff. I think that gives you more perspective. And, and I feel badly for guys that are just getting to the mid-40s and just kind of getting to a place where they feel comfortable with who they are. Yeah. Or they're like, F it, this is who I am. I mean, it's one or the other, right? And so, and that's why. Either lean into it or against it, right? Yeah. yeah, And and that's why I I say that. And I don't, and I'll go back. I I don't say I don't like the dads, but I think the the culture that I didn't expect when my kids got to high school was like earth shattering. Like people define themselves by their kids and it's like. Or their job. Their job. It's like the big nuts contest with guys. You know, I, I, I really hate that culture. Yeah, it's it's funny to me because I've kind of you know gone away from that now. Like yeah. I, I, for a very long time, the only thing I measured myself by was how much money I made and where it ranked amongst my friends. And it's like Jesus, what a fucking terrible way to live. Like, why does that matter? It's like what am I what am I accomplishing? Yeah. Literally nothing. I'm yeah. learning nothing about myself. I know nothing about the people around me. I'm spending no time like investing in relationships. I'm just money hungry. And then when you take that out of the equation. 
holy shit, is it like a freeing kind of feeling? Like I've now been able to learn so much about myself. I've developed deeper friendships and bonds with people in my life that I didn't have two years ago because I'm not measuring myself against anyone else. I want to see everyone succeed. I don't care what anyone else is doing. I want everyone yeah. to be, you know, thank rise God and see. Thank God you like that at 35. Yeah. It's usually like 53, I 55. Know. Yeah. When the hair and the grays and the stomach. Oh, I got the grays. And the, yeah. and the, the gravity. I got the stomach too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you don't have the relationship with the kids that you quite thought you had and, and things didn't end up a certain way. I mean, the, the, the I mean, I think the, the youth sports thing, um, I, I've seen it just become a nightmare because yeah. parents are spending so much money in the training and all the things for their kid. They're almost paying for an end result versus paying for the opportunity to Well, every learn kid something. thinks their kid is the next... You know, Kyler Murray or Adrian Peterson or whoever. And it's like, you know, it started being that when I was a kid, like that personal training kind of thing. And I'm super glad that my parents were never like that. Like I, I... I'm forever grateful of that. But yeah, it's just like the, and the amount of pressure that these kids are going under, it's going to, they're going to have the best therapy bills in the history of (laughs) the world. I've become more, more, more vocal about just being honest with people about where they are athletically. And I never was like, and I say, listen, dude, I'm one of the three best high school players to ever come out of my high school in the last like 40 years. That's awesome. Like me, I don't know, Caleb Williams, the quarterback for Oklahoma, wow. and, and like whoever else is number three. You know, like that's yeah. – and so I said, all right, I was a pretty good player in high school. Like, please get over yourself. Like, yeah. you're not even the best player in this conference, Yeah, in this league, you know, or whatever. Well, and, every dad's kid is the next Heisman Trophy winner. Yeah. No, it's it's – and and I have kids. I have a son who who starts in college, yeah. and I mean Duke football isn't winning a national championship anytime soon. And and they they have a certain type of kid. They're they're number one like GSR rate, graduate success rate, and all students. I mean, yeah. so you're getting something different out of that experience. But I said the things I talk to my son about now, I'm like I just try to listen. Hey, how, how's your week going? What'd you learn about yourself? Mm-hmm. What do you think? I'm curious as a father and a former NFL player, are you? hopeful or trepidatious at all about your son playing in the league uh i think if he has a chance to play in the league it represents one that he's good enough sure and it's not about me yeah and people and, and i and i call bs on everyone that talks about the genes oh mm-hmm. these the genes got the, well i didn't i didn't clone him i mean my wife's <laughs> yeah, right. involved in this equation yeah. you know the xy chromosomes and all yeah. that stuff always mix but um yeah I mean, I'd, I'd love him to play if it's in his if it's in God's will for him. Yeah. Um, just to get the access and the exposure and, and the things you get to see and and and, and the playing in cool stadiums and, and all that stuff and going to the steakhouse and not paying for anything and even though you can afford to pay for anything in the state, you know. So. Well, he will as a rookie, right? Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And then he's got to pay for everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> um, with both of them. But but I think I also told him that like, and I got this from Chris Rock stand up like twenty years ago. Like, look at the neighborhood. Everyone in this neighborhood didn't play in the NFL. You got a dentist, you got a doctor, you got a lawyer, you got a VC that, that guy. That Duke degree is going to do him good. Exactly, exactly. And 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 it's okay to struggle and try to find yourself. And 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 I'm like, please, please don't define yourself by whether or not you play in the NFL. Um, and so, and it's still going to. And if what if they, they don't like, it, they'll they'll have to be okay with that. You're not going to be okay with it. Trust me. Every yeah. no football player, high school, college, pro wants their career to be over mm-hmm. and it wasn't a choice yeah you know well I, whenever it's not your choice whenever anything in life is not your choice it's hard to swallow yeah let alone athletics where for so long you're what's well, a relationship you've yeah. had with yourself yeah you're identifying as going to parisi's your senior <laughs> eight years i mean that's that's been your identity a yeah. part of your identity and and so um i just try to protect them against that like hey look at uncle so-and-so he, he's a lawyer he's doing really well he makes couple hundred grand i mean there's different you try to just give them experience from other, other things totally um then just it, so that when you are getting the sports i don't know if you're a jets fan or not but no, like giants of course yeah so curtis martin who was always like yeah. I, I never even wanted to play football and really? i just was really good and i was oh wait a minute like you can actually get a scholarship but that was oh wait a minute i'm the best in the big east or now wait I'll get drafted. Like, wow. he literally had this unassuming, like, Hall of Fame career. And, like, he was the quietest guy on the on yeah, earth. Yeah. Yeah. And then when he, um, when he, <laughs> he's such a funny guy. Like, so, like, fashion guy, good looking dude. He dated Tony Braxton, like, when he was playing yeah. for the Jets, you know, like, one of those guys, you know. And so, um, 
But like being away from it and not taking it so seriously made him a better player. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the guys that are gung ho football, I was like, get away from it sometimes mentally. Hmm. Like go play video games, go watch a movie, like go do something else. Get like, life experience outside yeah, of your bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have to. You I have think to. when you look at like a lot of the problems that we have as like a society now, it's because of those innate very closed bubbles that are not allowing people to grow to a point that maybe 25, 30 years ago you could have. It's, yeah. it's an unfortunate thing. I, I'd be interested to see, I know we talk about leadership and we, I even want to talk about books and stuff. What do I rec what my recommendations are, but like, I'd be interesting to really see how my, my kids and their generation, like how they lead in 20 years, like what the world really looks like. A lot of robots, a lot of, uh, <laughs> automated processes yeah. and, uh, Probably healthy relationship with uh, SSRIs. Yeah. I would imagine it's going to be a completely different kind of society because there's going to be so much automation and so much algorithm-based life that who the fuck knows? I mean, and what's it going to be 50 years later after that? I don't know. We'll be gone, so... <laughs> That yeah, I won't, I won't be I won't be 99 years old. Yeah, I don't think. I'm not making my 80s. I mean, God willing, we'll all make it at least another 20 <laughs> I just want to be, and I, I joke with them all the time about when I'm leaving this earth, but like, I, I become my mom. Like, hey, and when, I, when I leave the earth, I was like, mom, stop, please. <laughs> but just, I told them, I don't want to like, not be like this ass kicker that you've known your whole life. I was like, once, I, once that happens, I was like, just, just pull the plug on me. Man. I, I said the same thing. I was like, if for any reason anything tragic ever happens to me, I want to be a burden to nobody. Like you don't want, I mean, especially yeah, a guy who played in the league, who's a giant strapping human being, like you don't want to be a burden on anybody. Of course. That's, I mean, that's common across, across life. Yeah. I, uh, I like to spend the last bit of every podcast asking sort of like some rapid fire questions. Some are super easy. Some are super, a little bit more in depth, but first thing that comes to mind, you know, top two, top three, whatever. What's your favorite book? My favorite book, so I, I've, I've gone through phases. Like I was big Malcolm Gladwell guy until mm. he and still he started saying football's bad for you. Then I was like, yeah. F, F this dude, you know. Yeah. Um, so the David and Goliath, I loved it. Blank Outliers, all that. I loved all loved that stuff. Outliers. All the Pat Lanconi stuff about just organizational culture. Mm -hmm. All those books are good. Um, uh, decoding greatness mm -hmm. right now, I think is number one for me. Um, it talks about how do you reverse engineer successful models to continue the success in other ways. Mm. And the most successful, he went through artists, music. He talked about the significance of like Tony Romo, what he did when he started announcing games. Like no one's done that. Like almost announcing and predicting the play up yeah, until the ball happens. snaps. And then now everyone's doing that. So yeah. like, that was almost like the Stuart Scott effect in the 90s with ESPN. <sighs> My favorite. You know, booyah. And then now yeah. everyone has this hip hop. Cooler like, than the other side of the pillow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all these hip hop uh, references on, on air now. But like. Very good book, by the way. I'm not sure if you've read his book. Stuart Scott's book? Yeah, yeah. Ex exceptional. Yeah. No, Big great, recommend. Great book. Um, so that book, uh, Decoding Greatness, um, um, Range is a good book about, just talks about being a generalist in this world of specializing everything. It kind of, mm -hmm. I love books that just turn common narratives all over their head and just, and says something opposite and it makes you really think. Oh, I like um, that. Range is good. Talks about being a generalist. Like, the the person who's a process person is a better CEO than a person who's just an accountant. It Ooh. becomes a finance person because that person understands people, structure, process. You know, so it's like the general surgeon versus the specialist. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, range and then um, Angela Duckworth grit was good. I mean, that's a decent. You know, okay. They went too long on the West Point analogy. Yeah, um, that's like a rare, rare set of people, um, and I think it just teaches you like circumstantially. Um, things happen that make you adjust the way you think, and then how do you respond after that? How does that change um, nice. at that point? And then that's like grit. That's like, oh, no one has any grit anymore. It's like, well, <laughs> it's just developed in different ways. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be rapid fire in my bag. No, 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 that's good. Yeah. I like that. What's your favorite movie? Oh, man, I'm not a movie guy as much as I used to be, but like Mo Better Blues is my favorite movie. Okay. Um, I watched the movie. I was 18 years old. It came out. And then it starts out talking about like where jazz, because I, I, I'm a big hip hop head and, and like jazz's influence on, on hip hop and like just like the blues. Tremendously, yeah. The, the blues influence on rock and roll and how all those like Led Zeppelin stones like stole all their, all their riffs from like Johnny Guitar Watson and Howling Muddy Wolf Waters. and all those Muddy yeah. Waters, all those guys. Yeah, yeah. so, um, but Mo Better Blues is like one, is like probably my favorite movie of all time because it, it's the love story, obviously Denzel's character is like the two people that he, and he ends up being with this one woman who's Spike Lee's sister. What, and then it in just, real life, yeah, yeah, Joali, yeah. I did and not then, know that. Yeah, and then he's, 
you know, it talks about gentrification of Brooklyn. It talks, I mean, it talks about all these things in like 1990 that we're like still dealing with. Yeah. Um, wow. And then the jazz score, of the movie. Um, I don't know if Marcellus, uh, um, Brandon Marcellus, whoever scored the movie was was great. No, I, I love that movie. Okay. No, I love that movie. I'll definitely. Uh, I think I saw that. I, I I took a class in college called like. Jeez, I don't, the art of film or something, mm-hmm. and that was one of the movies we watched because we did like a whole thing on Spike Lee and yeah, his influences, yeah, and yeah. yeah. Um, what is your favorite food? I would say anything spicy. Yeah, um, anything spicy. I mean, I I gave up meat like in the summer, um, so I've been heavy permanently. I just wanted my cholesterol to go down. Yeah, okay. Fair um, I miss the texture of meat, but then I'm eating more carbs than I need to. Yeah. Um, so I'm eating a lot of Mediterranean, a lot of Indian food now. Okay. Um, um, but and, that heat does you good. Yeah, all the heat, absolutely. I like to sweat when I'm eating. I, I, fat, I like heartburn. I mean, I need, I need to be sweating. As, and as a guy with heartburn. acid reflux, this is like terribleness for yeah. me. I'm like, oh, oh my yeah. god, I'm struggling. It, it sucks, but like, I actually love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. But I eat the spice that you would get like a t-shirt if you finish it, and I'm like struggling, <laughs> and I don't finish it, and they're like, everyone, you know, I'm that, I'm that guy in a restaurant. Wow, that's wild. Um, do you believe in an afterlife? Well, I, I'm a Christian, so I, I believe that um, you know we will see God again, and and I, I don't believe you come back as a flower or a plant or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I'm not, um, you know, you say you don't put your push your faith on other people, but I think as whatever you believe, if 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 it's if you feel like in your heart to share it, you should share your faith. Um, I agree with that. I know there's a different perspective about religion now and the culturally, but. Yeah, yeah. I I don't. I, I do believe in. I do believe we we go somewhere and and we live. And but if I think death is really like separation from God. Like you're not in. You're not shoveling coals. Yeah, right. In hell and and yeah. beginning pitchforks. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> no. I mean death and and just ending it is like that's your separation. I think it's funny. So this is going to be somewhere around my 60th podcast, and we're I'm tracking somewhere near 80 20 80 percent belief and there's something after mm-hmm. and that's very reassuring for me I'm, yeah. a, I'm a firm believer and I believe in God and I'm a Catholic and whatever but yeah. that's that's very nice that that kind of little nugget makes me think there is hope for society after yeah, all there is I think it's not I think we live in the hypocrisy of the leadership Ooh. of the church of these religious leaders and and oh sure. this guy this financial thing that happened and this person had some issue with the little boy or whatever that is and then and i and you know we both grew up catholic so we've we know where that goes but like i hate that that's that's become more important of a discussion than like why do you believe in something yeah for sure it's the story versus the actual story yeah yeah um what's your biggest dream dream as far as achievement for you like for right now like 48 year old roman what's like what do you still have left to accomplish? Like, what's one dream you have? I mean, the biggest dream I have is just for both of my boys to be like more successful than anything I could have ever accomplished. And that's when you know that like you, your your life meant something because Ooh. I impacted two two. I used to always tell them, "I was look, I'm not raising two boys." They're like, "What? I'm not a girl." I was like, "No, I'm, I'm raising two CEOs, two leaders, two whatever head coach, whatever you're going to be." Like, that's what I'm. That's what I'm raising. I was like, so everything we do has to be about that like Ooh. about being a leader that's beautiful yeah i like um, that and i always but i also tell them that like leadership is is um isn't perfect either there's a lot of poor leaders and poor communicators mm-hmm. um i mean it's like you hear the thing when people say like that's why there's only there's 40 whatever 46 presidents we're only still talking about the same four presidents yeah because you there's title and then there's actual leaders you that's know? good yeah so well, it's, i'm gonna- uh, I have to remember that one. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice someone's ever given you? Don't take everything personally. Um, focus on the process and not the end result. The end result will taste. Um, the, the grind is where you learn about yourself, is where you gain perspective. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you don't really get it until you look back. Hmm. Um, and so you're always working for something that you don't really know if it's going to work out. But like the journey and the grind is like, I don't know if you're a big Gary Vaynerchuk guy or not. Yeah, big Gary V guy. Yeah, so his whole thing about like digging your garage and like finding that one thing that's worth like $30,000. Yeah. And he's like, look, I, I have $30,000 in my back pocket. Yeah. But like the fact that I went through that just to get to find that one thing, like that's what, like that whole thing I think is, is valuable. I agree completely. It's a great lesson that no matter what your circumstances, there's always some way, somehow, something that you can do 
to get yourself out of a bad situation. Yeah. Monetarily, mentally, whatever. Yeah. There's so much more that you can do. Absolutely. Um, my last question is, what is one recommendation you have for everyone listening here today on something that you've recently consumed? Could be a book you read, a TV show, a podcast, movie, something that you've consumed lately that you loved that you'd like everyone to check out. I would say uh, try try some uh, Indian food. Um, <laughs> I would I would say. Um, Do you have a specific place in mind? Well, there's a place uh, I don't like to give restaurant shout outs um, because they're not they're not <laughs> discounting or giving me. I mean, I'm I'm still an athlete at heart. Right? Yeah, right. Like, I'll I'll mention you. About that you friends and family discount. Yeah, yeah, if you give me a free meal, I'll, I'll talk about the restaurant. But no, but just um, Indian just food. try try something new. Like whether it's something you eat, something you read. Like don't subscribe to like this is who I always am at this because you'll miss a lot out on life. I think that is incredibly important. I yeah. think I would not be anywhere near the person I am today if I lived like that. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I mean, my college roommate, I would make this like stuff with like, I love mushrooms and onions. He'd always take the mushrooms out. <laughs> I was like, you're not going to go to hell and, and burn and, if you yeah. eat mushrooms. You also don't, you know, he, he has in his mind that he didn't like it because he didn't like it when he was like 11. Yeah. And then like 25 year old. Joe, whoever he is, yeah. doesn't realize that maybe your taste buds change a little bit. You could try it out again. <laughs> that was me about guacamole. Oh my god, what? Yeah, like I like prom, you know. Yeah, drinking and like threw up like guacamole. All I mean, I remember I'll never forget that day. I was like, oh, I'm allergic to guacamole <laughs> because I threw up, and oh, I was wow. just it just caught me a certain way. That's so funny. Like five years ago, I started eating guacamole again. Change your life. Yeah, absolutely. I was the same way with bourbon. Uh, my cousin and my, I guess cousin-in-law, sister, his wife. Mm-hmm. Had a wedding in Memphis, drank c- copious amounts of bourbon at his wedding. And I threw up on the plane the next day going home, and I didn't drink bourbon for like six years. Yeah, the pandemic changed that, but yeah, yeah. you never know what you love until you lose it and then bring it back again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Roman, I'm incredibly appreciative of your time today. I'm so thankful that you were able to come on the podcast today. Um, I'm just really, really thankful that you were able to spend this time with me, and I really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Look forward to uh, seeing you again, hopefully at some point. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Take care.